Okay, we like to start off with our study as we are talking about last day events and the 144. We talked, I think, last time in reference to when did the Creator start working toward the 144,000? And we found out that that was at the beginning of time. He's interested in us. Okay, why is he interested in us? Well, the reason why he's interested in, interested in us is because his um, main focus is on how can he prepare his people for the last days. And so he knew that once we fell, once Adam and Eve fell, the Africans fell, that now there is a need to regroup and start a new plan. Now we call it the restoration plan, or um, we can call it a plan of renewing, okay? So we know that in the beginning, he created seven days. He created us in seven days. He created all the universe and everything, rested the seventh day. And on the sixth day, he made humans. And because he made humans on the sixth day, what we actually find out is that the same plan of creating the universe and creating everything, he's using that same plan in the last um, two, for six, for the Bible says that um, one day is as a thousand years with Yahweh. So if we use that scripture, we'll find that it'll take six days or 6,000 years for him to completely renew everything, or as I call it, um, recreation, or some call it recreation. So where he's recreating us into his image once again, and it will take this 6,000 years and we're around at near the end of that. And then like he rested on the seventh day, he, we're going to be able to rest with him for 1,000 years. That's called the sabbatical millennium. So there's a parallel to everything that he has, and he usually uses seven for that. And so when did he start? He started as soon as Adam and Eve fell. Okay. The next thing that we, um, we look at is the gospel versus the book of Revelation. Now, we talked about that before. We're not going to go into a lot of great detail with that um, because we did cover it. And so when we talk about... Um, the book of um, the book of the Gospels and the book of Revelation, each one has a part. The gospel part gives the order of events as it will be laid out in um, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. And in the book of Revelation, it doesn't give you an order. The book of Revelation just gives you details, great details, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven plagues, the beasts of the bottomless pit, the, the woman, um, Babylon, come out of her, my people, the angel's message. So it goes into great detail in all of that. It even goes into the first resurrection and the second resurrection. He talks about all of those things. So what we have to do is correlate, correlate the gospels, with the book of Revelation. We did that last time, and we're not gonna go into detail in that because we still got a lot, a lot of things to cover. And then we went into Daniel chapter 12 and the book of Revelation. When we talk about Daniel chapter 12, we already know the book of Revelation is gonna give us the details, so that's clear. Now, the question is, what is actually going to happen with Daniel chapter 12? In Daniel chapter 12, they have what they call the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. That's what it says in Matthew. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, we're going to see that again. So this is one portion of the um, gospel versus the book of Revelation. One portion is just going to be blown up. And that's where we'll go over the 1260 days or time, times, dividing of times, you read it in the Bible. It also refers to it as three and a half years. So all of those time frames we'll be looking at. Also, it talks about, and now when we look at that, we can also look at the time 
when we're talking about um, who do we who are we talking about? When we when we talk about in last um, at the time of Elijah, okay, let's just um, use Elijah for a minute. When we book when we talk about Elijah, um, Elijah um, was a prophet. The Bible says that in the last days that behold, I send my prophet Elijah the prophet. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I smite the earth with a curse. That's the last chapter of the Old Testament going into the New, explaining all of that to us. And so, basically what we have, when we look at that, we have to realize that time is moving on. And as it had, and specifically, as it relates to the time that Elijah lived, that they had to fight against Baal. And so the people of Yahweh was, for some reason, under Ahab and Jezebel, and they had forsaken and not known what the difference is to follow Yahweh. How to do that. So he's not sure exactly of that situation that he says um, for everybody to make a decision today. The decision is if Yahweh be Elohim, follow him. If Baal be God, follow him. There's an Elijah generation arising in this hour. You're the forerunners of Jesus, filled with glory and power. Voices in the wilderness, preparing the way. You are the generation that's seeking God's face. Come and worship the God who answers my fire. He says, I am your God. And the people answered him not a word. So this is the situation that we're finding ourselves in today. We have to, we are there to let the people know that, guess what? Today is the day of salvation. Today, you got to make a decision. Are you going to follow the creator or are you going to follow the world? And so that three and a half years or that 1260 days or that time, time, dividing of time is the same time frame that for three and a half years, they did not have rain. And so Israel was in a dilemma. And so that is the same situation that will be happening in the last days. And we will be called forth to make have people make a decision and they will have to make one. Are they going to follow Baal, man, or are they going to follow Yahweh? There is no in between. Okay, so during that specific time frame, Yahweh had it that he, there was this contest and it was like 400 of the priests of Baal and 450 priests of the grove. And they all came and, and Elijah said, okay, if whoever is the true creator, let him rain down fire from heaven and consume the altar. Okay? And so basically what had happened was that they were, since there was 450 of them and 400 and, uh, of the other ones, they, 850 of them, they got together and they started, you know, rallying up and offer up their sacrifice and there was no fire that came down from heaven and all the rest of that. So by the middle of the day, they were exhausted, tired. They were cutting themselves all of those different things. And then finally, they decided that, hey, we are tired. And so um, Elijah was making fun of them. Elijah said, point blank, if, I mean, if he's a God, then he must be in a journey. He must be wandering. Or maybe you must wake him up because he's asleep. And so as the day went on, they got tired. And then eventually Yahweh said, they said to Yahweh, was that the next thing that they're able to do is that he said, everybody come to me. So everybody came to Elijah and to the altar that he set up. Now, he just didn't set it up, but he also took and poured water on, or water on the sacrifice so that it was just over drenching with water. Well, three times he did that, that people do that. So they didn't have water because that hadn't rained for three days, but it could go down to the ocean 
and bring all that um, water from there, the seawater. And so basically what he had to do next was what he, have, what he has to do next is be able to prepare the people for what's about to happen. And so he prays. And he says, if he's the true creator, let fire come down from heaven. And the fire came down from heaven. And it lacked up all of the sacrifice, lacked up all of the water. Make sure everybody um, mute, your, um, mute your camera. Victor, you need to mute your camera. Okay? And so the next, the next thing that happened was when they rained it down, when he rained down fire from heaven, it consumed the water, it consumed the sacrifice, it consumed everything. And everybody said that Yahweh is the true God. And so at that point, since they knew that Yahweh was the true God, the God of heaven, then he said, grab them, the 400 groves, the 400 priests of Baal, grab them, and we're going to put them to death. And so that's what happened. And so today, Yahweh has promised that he will send Elijah the prophet. He will send back his message. He will use us just as he did in the days of John the Baptist. During the days of John the Baptist, he was the voice, one crying in the wilderness, make straight the ways of Yahweh. That's what we had. And so in this Daniel chapter 12, there's the 1260, which we just had a parallel as it relates to the time. And then not just 1260, we also have a 1290. The 1290 refers to um, 30 days after the Feast of Tabernacle. The way I had it was, of how we have it laid out in here, is that if you go back and you calculate um, the feast, you calculate from the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You count one year, you get to the Unleavened Bread. Count two years back to Unleavened Bread, get three years to Unleavened Bread. The 15th day of the first month. And if you go six months ahead, okay, now that'll be three and a half years, that'll put you at the Feast of Tabernacle. Most people didn't know that because that's on the 15th day of the seventh month. Then if you count another 30 days, you come up, with the eighth day, the 15th day of the eighth month, which was the day that Jeroboam set up his golden calves. So golden calves were set up at that particular time, and I believe that was the counterfeit. What they were trying to do was they were counterfeiting the Feast of Tabernacles. They were counterfeiting what Yahweh had set up. And so that's where the 1290 comes in. The 1335 after that, you have 45 days after 1290, I'm not quite sure I got that nailed down to um, what that clearly represents, but that would um, be part of the um, six plagues around the times of the plagues or the time of the, um, the blessed day. That's what it's called. It's called the blessed day. So I'm just giving you a little outline of how that ties in with the book of Revelation. Okay. So that's how that would um, be explained. Okay, then we're talking about Yahweh's calendar, okay? Most people didn't know that Yahweh has a calendar, okay? Everybody, a lot of people think that the only calendar that exists is, this, is the Roman calendar, okay? The papal calendar, or the calendar from the, what we call the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, no, there's more to them than that. Yahweh created his own calendar. His calendar, if you go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, he talks specifically about how he will, um, in, in this story of creation, we have at the top these particular days, the six days. And we show that the recreation that he's created, that he has mapped into it the um, the well, as an example, the first, the 10th day, okay, the 10th day of the first month, that's when we're supposed to lay, a lie, lay aside the lamb, okay? That should be offered up. Now, no, the lamb will be offered up, but it won't be offered up until the 14th day, which is the um, Passover. So there's four days in between. And so 
this gives you a time frame. The Bible says that the Messiah was laid down from the foundation of the world. So he was laid aside at the foundation of the world. That's in Revelation chapter 13. And so if you count four days from the 10th day laid down to the 14th day, you come to approximately 4,000 BC. I mean, 4,000, um, around 4,000 years since the fall of man. That puts you around 0, 33, 10 BC, that time frame. So that was to show that the lamb that was laid aside from the fall of man all the way up to the four, four days later, 4,000 years later, that he would come and he would be offered up. And so that's where the Passover falls in and that maps into that, okay? So we've been talking about this recreation and so we can see that recreation happening during that time frame. And then at the end, six, four, 2,000 years later, where we are, right around 2000 BC, this puts around 6,000 years of everything happening. Now that puts us in this um, situation that we find ourselves in. Now we are, the 144 will be created or recreated during the time of that 6,000 year around this time frame, such that the message can go forth. This here also ties in with the seals, the trumpets and the plagues, which are down here. And we go through those feast days and we go through that. And we help you understand the calendar that Yahweh has created. Remember, for every true, there's a counterfeit. Uh, the, um, what do we call them guys? The, um, yes, that the, that the counterfeit, what we call the Christian world, because the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse four, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ, saying that Jesus is the Christ and shall deceive many. Now, what organization, what group of people actually say that Jesus is the Christ? Now, in most pulpits, I remember hearing that I was told that it's Islam, that it was Buddha, that it was Krishna, it was, you know, everybody but the Christians. And I'm saying, well, Buddha don't come in the name of Jesus. Buddha don't call Jesus Christ. So we found out that it was the Christian movement. And then we go back and look at the, at the founding of the Roman church. Now there's a difference between when the Messiah was here on the planet and the message that he gave in the 12 disciples and what they did versus what happened at 500 BC when we called what we got, what we called, quote unquote, the Catholic Church. Or we got, quote unquote, not the Catholic Church. We have, quote unquote, what we called the Roman Church. And during that Roman time, they killed and persecuted the people of Yahweh. Most people don't even know that. Okay. Now, even today, we have what we call the Inquisition, the Protestants versus the Catholics and the Protestants were being persecuted, was being put to death. And so we constantly see that the church has been, the church has been the advocate of slavery. They were the ones who taught us slavery and they had all the ships named after, after people in the Bible. Most people didn't know that neither. But this whole movement that we quote unquote call the Christian movement is a white supremacist movement. That's basically what it was. That's why the KKK, you have the KKK, they burn crosses and they say, yeah, that they believe in Jesus. We had slavery in America and they believed in Jesus. So all of this stuff is, is a counterfeit. And so what we're trying to do is try to find out what is the truth. Now, question, back to this major question that we have to look at. Is America the number one superpower in prophecy? Now, wait a minute. And let's hold it there for one moment. Now, when we talk about last day events, or when we talk about different things that, as it pertains to last day events. Now, when we talk about the book of Daniel, we talk about um, Nebuchadnezzar, we talk about the um, Roman Empire, we talk about the Media Persian Empire, we talk about all of these different empires, okay? Now, and the, um, now, it's very interesting that we don't talk about the Greek Empire. The Greek Empire is not mentioned in there. Greeks are not really mentioned throughout the Old Testament or the New Testament. 
we just pick up from Malachi and we jump all the way to the Roman Empire. So the Greeks are not even in there. So now the question is the um, Roman Empire or these empires that existing today, that they, um, oh, they, they were superpowers in those days. Okay, Babylon was a superpower. We have um, Media Persia was a superpower. And we have Rome was a superpower. Yeah, we do have Greece, okay. In prophecy, yeah, I think they do talk about, yeah, they talk about Greece, that's right, okay. They talk about the, the Greece and then the Roman Empire. So what we want to look at, if these major empires were mentioned in the Bible, they were superpowers at that time, would the number one superpower of today in the last days be mentioned in the Bible? Of course it's mentioned in the Bible. Now the problem is, where is it mentioned in the Bible? <laughs> Well, in the book of Revelation, it talks about Revelation 13. Now, it, Revelation 13 is a very interesting chapter. It talks about different beasts going on, a whole lot of different beasts. It talks about the beast from the bottomless pit. It talks about from chapter 12. It talks about the dragon from chapter 12. It also talks about these other two characters that come in the picture. It talks about a beast that has horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. Now, the question is, do you know any nation on the planet that says that they are following God. Now, in our money, it says, in God we trust, right? Now, the question is, do we really trust God? Is America trust God? Do we really trust God? Okay, so we have this form that we claim to be the only nation, the only Christian nation on the planet. And that is most interesting. If we're the only Christian nation on the planet, then that would, you know, we would fit that, you know, symbol. The, um, the beast that, you know, have horns like a lamb. That we following Jesus. Yes, and that's what we are. And we're saying in the name of Jesus, we're going to conquer other nations. In the name of Jesus, we're going to enslave Africans. In the name of Jesus, we're going to convert the Native Americans and steal their land and wipe them out and tell them to go to Mexico and go to Canada, and if they try to come back in, they're illegal aliens. Now, that is the most greatest deception possible that a Christian nation can do. And we've done it. We've said that, you know, KKK, all of these guys that they are, they work with Jesus. The Nazism, all of these different things, it's like, I mean, anybody that got any sense understands what's going on. Anybody that don't understand what's going on because they don't have any sense. Well, that's only because we've been, what do we call it? We've been, um, I don't, I'm not sure how to put it, but we've been placed in a position that we can't perceive what's going on. We're sort of like, oh, this is how the Bible decides, describes it. It says, all the world wandered after the beast. It says all the world is drunk. We have become drunk. We have been intoxicated with materialism and with the world such that we can't determine what is right or what is wrong. We can't tell the difference between the true and the counterfeit. Now, why are we in a position like that? Well, lots of reasons why. And we'll go through some of them eventually. But so now the next thing we would like to look at or at least think about as it says then, then it says that it, was, it has horns like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. Now, the dragon would represent Lucifer. So now who acts like the devil? <laughs> yes, that is correct. What superpower? The superpowers, we blaming Russia. We say Russia is the enemy. Russia is, China is, Korea is. Everybody on the planet is our enemy. I said, wow, man, that's, that's simple. That, but wait a minute, we the superpower of the planet, so how can everybody be, you know? But at the same time, we make, as the and Native American says, we speak with forked tongue. So we would make promises with the Native Americans about their lamb, and then we wipe them out. So, you know, we speak like a dragon. So is American prophecy? No question. Okay, there's also another one that it says that he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should all speak and cause that as many as would not worship the beast should be killed. Now that is pretty serious. We're talking about a death decree of anybody who will not worship the beast and his image. Now the question is, who is the image or what is the image of the beast? And the question is, who 
or what is the beast? So all of these things we be like, you know, these are all studies all by themselves. And so we're gonna get into those eventually. But as we go through, we have to understand what has America done? We are the superpower, there's no question about it. Are we following Yahweh? Nah, I don't know about all that. But we would say that we are. Well, if so, what are the consequences? Okay, we have here, we talked a little bit about Revelation already. Is it in both? Now, economically, uh, is America spiritually bankrupt? Are we? Um, I would think so. Some would say yes, some would say no. But I mean, what is spiritual? I mean, have we become as Sodom and Gomorrah? You remember, that was superpower too. And fire rained down from heaven. Is, yes, we have made it law that homosexuality is okay. So yes, we have become a Sodom and Gomorrah. So will we get fire rained down from heaven? If we trust his word, what does it say? In Jude chapter one, verses five through seven, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, homosexuality, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance. vengeance. Okay, so he lets us know that. Now, why did 9-11 happen? Well, we blamed it on Saddam Hussein first. That's what we blamed it on. We said Saddam Hussein was behind it, and we're going to shut down Saddam Hussein. So then that, what did we do? We created a war on Saddam Hussein, who had nothing to do with 9-11. But we already wanted to take him out anyway. So that was just an excuse. OK? Then these attacks happened in the big cities of America. OK? I asked the question, why? If I was truly, if our cities are truly become Sodom and Gomorrah, Elohim cannot protect us. Wow, that is heavy. Now, did he send in somebody for, for Lot? Are we like Lot? Let's think about it. Is Elohim calling his people out from these big cities? Like he called Lot out of the city? Genesis chapter 19, verses 12 through 17. And the men said unto Lot, as thou hear any besides thyself. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them are waxing great before the face of Yahweh. And Yahweh has sent us to destroy it. Lest thou be consumed in iniquity of the city. Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither say thou, stay thou in the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Now, has, has, has Yahweh called us out of these big cities? Has he called us out of these places that will be destroyed? Who can read the future? Where is security? Now, right now we got homeland security and people believe that we are secure. Okay, but how can we be secure when spiritually we don't have anything to be secure Okay, we cannot depend on anything earthly, but that's all we depend on. We depend on man and his earthliness. We depend on materialism. We depend on all of these different things. And so, what do we say? We are really in trouble. Okay, so then, Now, some people said that they're willing to give up their liberty for security, for convenience. Slowly, we're losing our liberty and our conscience is being attacked. For what? Did this save the great Roman Empire or any other superpower in the past? Please remember the scripture. First Thessalonians chapter five, Verses one through three. But of the times and the season, brethren, we have no need that we write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly well that the day of Yahweh so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, what? Peace and safety. That's what we're talking today. Peace and safety. We having been secure. Yep. 
and we're giving up all our rights for everything. Monitor every conversation, monitor everything, put everything in there. We don't have any rights, really. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Wow. Please let us not depend on anything earthly that leads to false security, the false mark of the beast. Some call this false security the mark of the beast. However way we look at this, what do you call it? What will the government call it? Now we know about the mark of the beast, we've heard about it. Many people have heard many things about it. We didn't know what it was. Now I hear that they're actually putting um, disc and um, chips in people's hands. Before I know that people were saying that they were looking at um, taking your eye. Right now they said that for your phone, some places that they just have that you have to scan your eye, okay? Or you use your thumbprint to get into your phone. Now just imagine if they're using that for your phone, just imagine what they're gonna be more security in reference to a credit card or you know buying and selling. Okay, so what does the Bible say? In Revelation 13, we've been spending a lot of time in Revelation 13 today. Revelation 13 verses 13 through 70. And I beheld another beast come out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb. But anyway, we're not gonna go into that right now. I think we summarized that one already. That we can't buy or sell. Now, when we had the economics collapse and the housing collapse in the 2000s, where does it take us? So the events that are still before us that we should be thinking about is the seven trumpets of the apocalypse. Revelation 18, verse eight and 13 says, and the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain, or as an asteroid, asteroids, are called mountains in um, space terms. Burning with fire was cast into the earth. Whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the third angels, which are yet to sound. Now, now what I did was I went through and said, okay, if an impact hit with NASA and so forth, how would it affect us? And so an asteroid impact would cause a lot of damage. Now, is it the damages that's mentioned inside of the Bible? Yes, you'll, you'll read that, you'll see some of these mentioned in the Bible. Um, I can't blow this up right here, but it talks about um, a blast and it talks about the sun being darkened. It talks about tidal waves. It talks about some of these um, crust of the earth to be thrown up into the sky. All of these different things. And the, and the earth will wobble like water and it will just stop, okay? Because it'll be just like a vibration. So those are some of the things that we will be thinking about or looking at. Some of the other events, current events that we will be looking at or that we can look at, we're running out of time. We have another five minutes left. And so we'll, 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 we'll have our last one next week will be our last um, webinar to conclude the rest of this um, presentation of that goes along with the ebook that you should have. Okay, we'll talk about some of the current events as we just talked about, and there's a lot of earthquakes. And I was just thinking recently, um, we've been hearing, I think last week, that they said that the worst um, storms of fire, forest fires, has hit um, what we call um, ca um, California. It's been the worst that they've ever recorded. And so since it's been the worst that they ever recorded, we've been getting major earthquakes around the planet also. And also we've been getting these storms or these hurricanes that has torn up Puerto Rico and other places. And so all of these events the Bible talks about, the Bible refers to that in the last days under these seals that we'll have, you know, these earthquakes, we'll have a lot of different events similar to this. So we are most definitely finding ourselves in this time. And what we want to do is be able to correlate these times with what's going on. It also talks about wars and rumors of wars. And we know that, you know, people got their hands on the trigger. And we know not just of wars and rumors of wars, but we also know that 
um, disease has been increasing and things have been getting out of hand. And we're going to see that get out of hand even more because the diseases that we've been able to control in the past, we can't control today. So where does it put us? It put us at the time, as some would say, at the time of the end. What are we going to do? What can we trust in? What can we believe in? We can't believe in anything earthly. We can't depend on anything material. But the world would have us to depend on all of those things. So my guess and my point to you is, let's wake up. Let us understand that the end is here. And so as we move on from one week to the other, as we go through these studies, we pray that we'll be able to truly understand what's going on so that we might be ready for his end time. Well, I'd like to thank you for all being here. Like I said, look out for the um, webinar that we're going to send out for next weekend so that you can just log right on in. Bring your friends. It's a free webinar, so there's no reason why no one should be here for free. It's a free ebook on all of those different things. Okay, so may Yahweh bless you. May his wonderful grace be upon you. May he give you peace. Thank you, and may Yahweh bless you. Have a nice day.